so this will be part three of the worksheet and you should still have the numbers in your calculator you've added those back in there and the first thing I want to do is just get us all on the same page with the calculator so press stat test and we're going to do the Linreg T test this is performing the functions that we went through back in in the second uh, part of this worksheet the X list is L1 the Y list is L2 this little symbol here is a row for the true correlation and we want it to be positive so that's the greater than zero when I type a Y1 here that tells me where the calculator is going to store the equation if you've forgotten that's under vars Y vars function Y1 and then you calculate and this gives you a whole host of information and included in doing all this it also found residuals for you it doesn't show you the residuals here but it calculated them and stored them into a, a list resid I also went through and typed all this data into Minitab a computer software program and here's what Minitab gave me now what I want us to do with this because one of the expectations is that you can read computer output I want us to go through the computer output and talk about every single part of it and make sure you know what all of this means so that if you don't have the data but you just have this you're in good shape so first of all what is the regression equation that's your LSRL and what is it now if you say 91.3 plus 1 1.49 X that's an expression not an equation so what do you got to have you gotta have the hat now if you wrote it like that y hat equals 91.3 plus 1.49 X then you also have to define. define your terms you could simply write this right here with a hat on it many tab allows you to label your your lists so I labeled them cry count and IQ and then that way instead of using X and Y it uses the actual variable names but that circled part is the regression equation cleverly enough the part right after it says the regression equation is which reminds me of the number one rule for looking at computer output don't freak out don't freak out if you just won't freak out you'll be in good shape you should read it all you should ignore the stuff you don't understand but overall don't freak out and you'll be fine all right now I want you to look at all these numbers down here and see if any of them make sense or look familiar especially considering what you have on your calculator right in front of you so when you see something you're like hey I know what that is tell me 91.268 is what Sarah that's a so this the coefficient of the constant the coefficient of the constant that is a which is my y-intercept right and what is a estimate estimate for alpha estimate for alpha the true y-intercept Christina good so this is B which is my slope which is my estimate for beta the true slope now if I had left all of this stuff off up here at the top I would expect you to be able to get the slope and the y-intercept from this table right here it's the same thing above it it's just rounded off to a couple of decimals and down here we've got more digits shown okay good what else do you see you recognize Elena the thing under this is not Y bar it's the standard deviation of alpha great so this is S E A the standard deviation of the Y intercept which would make you think that this is S E B which if you went back and looked at whatever number that is on the worksheet that's what we calculated it to be that's the standard error of the slope okay good you guys are doing great what else do you see 3.07 is my T so this is my T test statistic and you remember the T test statistic is given by the formula B over SEB so if I took 1.4929 and divided it by 0 0.4870 I would get this some other programs call this the T ratio 
because it's just that that fraction or that ratio of T, I mean, of B and SEB. All right, what else do you see? Good. What is this? That's the standard deviation of the line. It's the two-dimensional standard deviation. An idea of how spread out the points are from the line. This is the estimate for sigma, which you should have seen if you've done your homework. Now, it's a good time to remind you that although some of you don't worry about homework until the night before the test, that experiment went horribly awry in chapter 12, and it might be worth looking at some homework sometime between now and the day before the test. So you got room to ask some questions or to let it sink in. Right, so this T right here is the test statistic for the, for the y-intercept. This is A over SEA. Now, we normally are not concerned with doing a test on the y-intercept, especially in this class. But the reason we're less concerned with the y-intercept is mu much of the time, the y-intercept um, doesn't really, it's not really relevant or even practical. So back in Chapter 3, we did a problem that involved the cost of a Model T compared to the year. Well, the y-intercept would tell me how much a Model T would cost Mary and Joseph if they had gotten a Model T instead of the donkey, right? It's irrelevant. It's dumb to talk about that because we don't look at the domain all the way back to year zero. Most of the time, what we're much more interested in is the slope. How much do we expect Y to change if X changes by this much? It's not what would, what would your grade be if you did absolutely zero work. The question is, if you study one more hour, what do we expect your grade to do? That's what's really interesting. So, so that 10.22, we're not going to use it in this class, but that's what it is. It's the same idea. All right, what else do you see? There's three more numbers. We got to define them all. Good. So this one right here is R squared, which is 0 0.207. And R squared, what's the name of R squared? Coefficient of determination. So that tells me that 20.7% of the change in IQ could have been predicted by the use of this line. In other words, when the kid has one more cry, I expect his IQ to change some. Well, some of that change, the line anticipated, 20.7% of that change. Now, what else can I get from R squared? R, that's a trick question. How do you get R from R squared? I told you it's a trick question. There's more to it than square root it. Square, square root to 0 0.207, so I got to move the decimal over, but then what? Yeah, so something about absolute value. I got to be concerned about the sign. You can't have a negative R squared, but you can have a negative R. So the answer, though, is not plus or minus. It's either plus or it's minus. Good, it's one or the other. So which one is it, Maggie? Good, figure it out based on the correlation of the line. So what is the correlation of the line in this problem? Positive, and you know that because the because the slope is positive. So in this case, it's the positive square root of 0 0.207. Probably on your test, it'll be the negative square root of whatever it is, right? Because that's just the way it goes. But you got to worry about, is it plus or is it minus? And then you just square root that. Okay, so we're down to two other numbers. What do you suppose the numbers under P represent? P value, but that's not our P value. All right, well, first, this is the p-value if I did a test on the y-intercept, and this is the p-value if I did the test on the slope. Now, what we did on our calculator was the test of the slope, but what gives? It's not round off error. It's, it's testing that. This is actually HA. We didn't do the two-sided test. We did the one-sided test. Minitab didn't give me the option of doing a one-sided test or a two-sided test. It is double. It is exactly double. They just didn't show all the digits. So if you have this on Minitab and you want to figure out the one-sided test like we did, you'd have to divide it by two. Now, the problem is, and I understand this is a problem, some of the, pro some of the computer programs give you the one-sided answer and some give you the two-sided answer. If you were using this in your job, you would be comfortable with the program and you'd know what it was. 
you're using this in your stat class and we give you different computer programs and it's a little tougher to figure out. What if you just ignore that? Can you figure out the p-value? Now you're like, yeah, coach, it's on my calculator. But it's only on your calculator because I gave you all the data and you did it. What if I didn't give you all the data? What if I gave you this printout and I said, hey, do a test, do a hypothesis test. Maybe I cover this up. How would you figure out the p-value? Okay, so I got the test statistic, 3.07, and what do I do with it? I can use the green chart. I can use my T distribution chart with 36 degrees of freedom because it's N minus 2. Then I have to write that on here. I didn't give you that with the mini tab output. And then I could go over and find the p-value. Or if you're using your calculator, you can do TCDF of the lower bound, upper bound degree of freedom. And that will also give you the 0 0.002. Now, for that matter, what if I covered up the t-test statistics? Could you figure that out? Could I figure it out with this? Yeah, I can use the ratio thing. And there's the B, and there's the SEB. So it's 1.4929 divided by 0 0.4870. That's going to be this. So you ought to be able to look at the computer output and pretty much get everything you need. In fact, I would say you should prefer the computer output because you avoided having to type all that stuff in your calculator and make sure it was right, and it did all the mathematics for you. You just have to figure out what it all means. So there's the computer output, and the next thing we need to do is talk about the conditions that are necessary to work this problem out. And so uh, we'll talk through them, and then I'll go through and show you on the sheet uh, what the conditions actually are and what that means. So what's a condition that we always need? SRS. And next year I've decided that when I have my students write SRS, I'm going to have them write SRS of something. Because as I grade a Chapter 13 test, I'm not convinced that you guys always know that. So what is this an SRS of? Babies. It's an SRS of babies. It's not an SRS of crying. It's not an SRS of IQ. It's an SRS of babies, hopefully. And if it is an SRS of babies, then I can apply my results to babies. But if it's just an SRS of babies born in College Station, then my results may only apply to babies born in College Station or whatever group that I got these babies from. All right, so we always talk about SRS being a necessary condition because the, the method that the sample was taken is crucial. There's two other ideas that we always address. What are the other two ideas? Well, we talk about independence, so I'll give a brief uh, side bit on that because it kind of relates to Chapter 13 as well. In Chapter 13, with the, the matrix problems, the chi-squared problems, a few of you guys wrote as a condition that I hope these two variables are independent. Don't write that. How come? That's what the test is, right? That's the whole test is to see if they're independent. Now, in this chapter, if I'm doing a test... If I'm doing a test here, beta is zero. That means if beta is zero, that the true line is horizontal, which means as x changes, y doesn't care, which means x and y are not related to each other, which means x and y are independent. So again, in chapter 14, I don't want to say that the two variables are independent because that's actually what the test is testing for, is to see if they're independent. Now, that being said, do I want the babies themselves to be independent of one another? Yes. Do I need to mention that? Good. I don't have to mention that because that's part of being a simple random sample. Okay. All right. So what else do I need? So independence is something that we want to look at. And I guess I should bring this up too. How many, how many uh, samples do I have in this problem? No, that's how, many, that's how many subjects I have. Or that's what N is. N is 38. How many samples do I have? One. I got one group. How many variables do I have? Two, this is different from what we did in, say, Chapter 12, where we had proportion problems, like, say, uh, kids that had sickle cell anemia and kids that didn't. Now, how many, how many groups do I have there? Two, what was the variable? One variable, whether or not they had malaria, right? 
it was the same variable for both groups. It wasn't two variables. It was, do the kids with sickle cell get malaria, yes or no? Do the kids without sickle cell get malaria, yes or no? So what we've done in the past may have been two sample problems, but now we're talking about two variable problems with this stuff here. That's why we're graphing it on a scatter plot instead of a histogram. Okay, so we talk about SRS. We just addressed whether we need to do independence or not. What else do I need to address? Okay, what does sample size allow me to do? If I have a big sample size, then I can treat the data as normal. So I've got something about the shape. So we have this SRS. We address the shape. We'd like it to be normal. And there's one other thing that we have. Okay, and we've got some deal with the population being really big, which allows me to do what? Something with standard deviation, exactly. So those are really the same three things that I have to address now. SRS, something with the shape, something with the standard deviation. These are a little hard for you to grasp intuitively, I think, so I'm going to go through them. We also throw in one more condition right here. I hope for these problems that the true relationship is linear. If the true relationship is not linear, then it's dumb for me to talk about the slope of the line. If there's no line, why would I want to talk about the slope of the line? So the so the first, besides an SRS, the first condition we have that's unique here is we've got to look at the relationship between X and Y. Do we think that the true relationship is linear? If the answer is yes, you can proceed. If the answer is no, you don't need to do inference on linear regression. That would be foolish. How do you, how do you test to see if you think the true relationship is linear? A residual plot. And what do I want to see in the residual plot? No pattern, okay? And we'll write all this down in just a second. We're just talking through it right now. Okay, the next thing I need is I want the points to be sort of close to the line. So let me draw this for you again. This is going to be a scatter plot of the data, and I'm going to make it really big right here. All right, this distance right here is called what? Residuals. So I got all these different residuals. There's 38 different residuals. What I hope is that most of the points are. Why is it not going to let me do this? Hang on one second. I got an idea. All right, I can draw on this one. I hope that most of the points are in there like maybe 68% of them. And I hope that maybe like 95% of them are in there. And I hope that like 99.7% of them are in there. In other words, most of the points are pretty close to the line and very few points are a long way from the line. Now, what would you say this distance right here is? A standard deviation, that 17 and a half that we're talking about. Okay, so I hope that the, the, the way this is written on, their, on your notes is that the points need to be normally distributed from the line. The residuals. The residuals here need to be normal around this line. So how can I check to see if some data is normal? Do a histogram of the residuals. So here it is. Here's my histogram of the residuals. So I made a histogram of the residuals. Does that appear to be normal to you? Well, it's a little bit off, but it's actually not as bad as you'd think. Because if I just took a couple of points out of this second tower, and they were just slightly bigger, they would have bumped over into the third tower. And then it would probably look sort of normalish. Right? So it's not great, but it's not awful. What is this vertical line? That's my y-axis. And if the points were actually normally distributed, half of them would be positive and half of them would be negative. This one's not quite perfect. But it's, it's not too bad. Okay? Some of you may say, I'd like to do a normal probability plot. Fine. Let's do a normal probability plot then. That is the sixth graph. What do I want the normal probability plot to look like? A straight line. If it's straight, the data are normal. If it's sort of straight, the data are close to normal. Not too bad. Over here, I get a little bit of, of goofiness, but it's not too bad because the data are not too non-normal. That's a good thing. All right, we also need 
the standard deviation to be sort of the same all the way throughout my graph. In other words, this is another residual plot of some different data. It's problematic because over here for small values of x, the line does a pretty good job. How do I know it does a pretty good job? The residuals are small. The points are close to the line. Over here, on the big, for big x's, the line does a crummy job. It's doing an increasingly poor job as x gets bigger. That's a problem. It, it's probably still linear because I don't see a, uh, you know, a certain kind of pattern. I just see that it's doing a worse job as x gets bigger. So what I would actually want to do here is restrict my domain to a certain part. What this means is the standard deviation on the left side of the graph is not the same as the standard deviation on the right side of the graph. Think about this example. Suppose I, I do a little guess your weight game at the fair, and it turns out that I'm really good for infants. I'm almost always within five pounds. But as you get older, like into your 20s, I do a worse and worse job. My guessing is worse and worse. My spread on my errors is greater and greater as people get into their 20s. But down here for little kiddos, I'm usually pretty good. Okay, well, that would be, I'd need to analyze things differently. I could analyze it for kids separately than I analyzed it for full-grown people. Um, so that's a problem. That's another condition. And finally, the, the last thing is I need all of the, let me go back to this one. I need the residuals for a certain x value to be independent of one another. And I know I said independence a second ago. This is a slightly different take on it. In other words, if I have a bunch of kids that had 18 cries, then all their values along here need to be independent of one another. They may all be, I still expect them to be closer to that line. So they're not necessarily totally different. Um, you know, the kids that had 16, I would expect to get lower IQs than the kid that had 18. But I expect these values here to be independent of one another and just tend to be more bunched around the line. So I'm going to show you how that's written up and we'll talk through them uh, one more time. This is at the top of the third page of your worksheet. You might look at that now. In order to perform inference on regression, we need to satisfy three conditions. Yeah, really four. I didn't write on here that we need it to be an SRS because I think that's sort of the omnipresent condition. And that goes with any kind of sampling. So yes, we still want it to be SRS. The first bullet says the true relationship is linear. How do I check it? Well, I look at a residual plot, and I want to see no pattern in that residual plot. And now, hang on. Now let's skip to number three. I guess I'll call SRS as number zero. On number three... How do, I, how do I check that? The standard deviation of y, sigma, is the same for all values of x. What do I look at? Yeah, the same kind of graph, the residual plot, just like this one. Whoops, sorry, this one. That's a residual plot. I didn't label it here, but if I did, this is resids, and this is some sort of x value for whatever the problem was. So here, I still want to look at the residual plot and check out the spread. Remember, standard deviation is a fancy word for spread. I want the spread to be the same for small x values as it is for big x values. And we're not going to perform any funky test or any high-level deal on it. Look at it and see what you think. Stat 101. All right, so now let's go back to number two. For each value of x, the response y will vary normally around the true line. How did I check that? That's when I made a histogram of the residuals. So here I want a histogram of the residuals. Now some of you guys have gotten in the bad habit of not actually checking your conditions. You just write the conditions and then write check, check, check. Okay, that's not checking your conditions. Check your conditions means write them down and see if it meets the, the standards of the problem. 
see if the problem matches up with this. So I actually want you to sketch me out a little histogram. Because if you just say, it does, I don't know if you actually did it on your calculator or you're just lazy and you wrote, hey, it works. Woo, move on. So sketch out a histogram. And, it, and this one, I hope that histogram looks sort of normal. On one and three, I hope the residual plot shows no pattern and no change in spread. Now this part of number two, which I suppose if I made a different worksheet, I might number it differently. That part, we're just going to have to assume. Because we're not going to perform any tests or any ideas to see if those values are actually independent of one another. And yes, there is a bunch of writing when we have to do all these conditions. It is. It stinks, I agree. But it's necessary because it's, it's really the crux of what's going on in statistics. It's not, can you stick numbers in a function or into a computer or a calculator and hit enter. It's, you know, which function to stick it into. And which function you stick it into is totally dependent on what whether these conditions are met. So there's the conditions that are necessary uh, for inference on regression. And the only other thing that I need to go through and explain to you that I'll do in a different format is this stuff at the very end, those formulas that involve a confidence interval and a prediction interval, which is a little bit different kind of deal. And I'll try to work that with you guys tomorrow. So there's part three, and I think we wrapped up the, the crying and IQ worksheet uh, as such.